morning. morning. And welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of the Catskills. Our minister is Reverend Bob Janice Dillon, and I am Kathy Atwell sitting in for Liz Thomas, who had unavoidable, couldn't come this morning. So it's going to be hopefully not too much of a train wreck, but this was like all these emails last night. Ah! So you got me this morning again. We're excited to have attendees both in person in the sanctuary as well as uh, any virtual via Zoom. A big welcome to everyone. Unitarian Universalism is a liberal religious faith that carries no creed and welcomes all seekers. Whoever you are, whomever you love, wherever you are in life's journey, you are welcome here. We are guided by a set of principles and written sources that encompass the many ways we come to know and understand the world, the universe, and the divine. <clears throat> our principles are important to us at UU Catskills, and we live our values on a daily basis. We affirm that Black Lives Matter. We are a welcoming congregation for the LGBTQ community. We are a congressional affiliate of the Ulster Immigration Defense Network. We are an active voice in the effort to address climate change. Community circles connect members with others who live in their local community. There are nine circles in different areas who meet monthly in person and online through Zoom. If you'd like to get in touch with the circle in your area, please contact the office administrator. And I will tell you from a personal experience that our group meets actually every two weeks instead of monthly. And it has been uh, lovely to get to know more people in, um, in my area, and especially since I'm kind of new to the area. So I encourage you to reach out to your community circles. If you'd like to contact someone at the UU Catskills, for those who are attending online, a contact list is shown on your screen. Just checking to see it's on my screen. You can visit our website, uucatskills.org, to find contact information. You can also be added to our mailing list and find the latest newsletter. If you're a visitor online and would like to add, be added to our mailing list, you can put your name and email address in the chat box area on Zoom. We encourage you to read our April newsletter and that members and others of our on our distribution list received by email. The newsletter is also found on our website. It contains newsworthy items, the happenings in our UU community, and also upcoming events for the month. Weekly updates are also sent by email, which highlights events for the coming week. Every year, we ask our members to recommit themselves to our UU community by pledging their financial support for the next year. Your pledge is a gift which will be used wisely to maintain our sanctuary and farmhouse and to provide for our services and outreach programs. Karma and Lois will be available after today's service to assist those in need with pledging online. The pledge drive ends April 5th. After the service, there will be a pop-up fundraiser in the sanctuary. You can kind of see they're getting set up for it. Vendors will donate a percentage of their uh, percentage to donate a percentage to UU Catskills. Please give them your support. Saturday, April 9th from 10 to 2, and Sunday, April 10th from 12:30 to 3, our spring cleanup days are here at UU Catskills. Come and help clean up the sanctuary grounds. Bring your boots, gloves, and rakes. Next Sunday, April 10th, Julio Torres will be in the pulpit, joining us virtually from his home in London. April 17th, the Climate Action Team will present a special Earth Day service, which includes the musical group Spirit of Thunderheart. As we worship together in this, this sanctuary this morning, the children are gathering together over at the farmhouse. For for religious exploration. Today's theme is Stop and Smell the Roses. Thanks to everyone who is assisting with today's service. 
Our hybrid services are made possible by our technical team. Bruce Wildey, who is here in the sanctuary, provides for our live streaming from the pulpit. Our Zoom hostess this week is Don Kirchel, and our shusher is Leela Clark. Friends on Zoom, you will notice that we no longer, you are no longer put in a waiting room where an usher admits you to the service. Now attendees go directly to the service. This means we have only a shusher who will mute attendees or turn their audio off as needed during the service. Please help us by keeping yourself muted during the service. After the service, those attending via Zoom, please stay for a virtual coffee break in our breakout rooms. Our prelude this morning, Bill Toole will perform High Plains by Philip Ogberg. Bring us your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Remember that poem, Emma Goldman? It's on the Statue of Liberty. It's reminded of that this morning. Anyone feeling a little bit tired this morning? Soul tired, personally tired. You are welcome. Is anyone uh, poor, going through financial insecurity, as so many of us do, or maybe struggling to find a little more joy, a little more hope, a little more oomph uh, in our lives? You are welcome here. As for huddled masses, we are socially distanced in this hall, but uh, we try to be as best we can. And those at home, you maybe uh, have as much room as you, as you like, but we are, are joined together and we say, bring us 
uh, your, your uh, people from, from all walks of life. Bring us uh, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and straight from every race and culture with going through every one of life's difficulties and challenges and triumphs. You are welcome here. We are delighted that you are here with us in this uh, community of meaning making and service. A big thank you to Kathy Atwell, who's filling in at the last minute. Uh, she's not Liz Thomas, as it says on your order of service. Liz is quarantining due to a, a COVID, positive COVID test at her daughter's daycare. So we thank uh, Liz for keeping us safe and wish the best to Liz and her family and the family who had the positive result. Good, uh, let's all be, be safe. Um, special welcome to, to newcomers, as Kathy said. We do periodic introductory session, or UU 101. We explain about Unitarian Universalism and describe opportunities at this congregation. So if you're interested in that, we can do that um, at your leisure. So let us know if you're interested in learning more about what Unitarian Universalism is all about or um, about uh, this, this congregation at UU Catskills. Um, as Kathy said, a lot is happening after the service. If you're here in the sanctuary, if, I hope you'll be able to stick around for the pop-up mart, uh, which is happening here. It's going to be a really special day. For those online, you're welcome to join on the online breakout rooms, uh, get to know someone you haven't met before, and complain about the length of the sermon, which I assume is what people talk about. It's not that long today, I don't think. Um, and again, this is, this is a repeat announcement because it's a big one. The 9th and 10th, next Saturday and Sunday, are cleanup days here at the congregation. So anyone is welcome. Uh, we'd love for you to help. You know, if you're able to help out, that's great. I think well, there'll be a pizza lunch, right? Am I, am I promising something? We're going to have a pizza lunch. So if there's pizza, I mean, come on. Um, so hope you can make it there. That would, be, that would be much appreciated if you can come either Saturday or Sunday. Uh, we have a very special announcement from the organization Mentor Me, uh, which, uh, which is uh, coordinated with the, the Kingston Interfaith Council. I got to uh, meet Stephanie through, through the Interfaith Council. So I'd like to uh, welcome Aaron Hilgart and Stephanie Kressner. And Aaron's going to say just a brief word about Mentor Me. for a second um, but I after at the end of last year I was telling myself do not volunteer for any more boards no more volunteer work you have your hands full but then um, Reverend Bob put a announcement around oh thank you for the support here <laughs> Reverend Bob put an announcement about some things you could get involved in kind of within the congregation and in our community and something about just the sentence that he wrote about mentor me and that Stephanie Kresser had come and spoken to the interfaith council um, just, I was like four hours a month, I can definitely help out. So, you, you know, the, uh, so I, it's basically like Big Brother, Big Sister, which I am told before my time here that the congregation was involved in. Stephanie can fill you in at a later time about um, the history of that and how there hasn't been one in Ulster County and she founded Mentor Me to fill that gap. And so I came expecting, you know, a, a well-run organization where they'll match you with a mentee and do background checks and all the stuff that I know Big Brother Big Sister does. But I will say, I find it to be kind of much more than that. Um, Stephanie's a great leader and has built an amazing kind of culture within the organization of mentors. And what, it's over 100 mentees? And we have over 140 mentees. Yeah. And 70 and mentors. And 82 mentors right now about 85% of our mentees are undocumented children from Guatemala. So yeah, it's a fantastic organization. And so I'm, I kind of threw myself all in and I'm really excited to be part of it. So I just wanted to extend the invitation. If there is anyone within the congregation considering being a mentor, it's, you know, when I went to my first event, one other mom came to me and said, oh, it's, it's unusual to meet another mom. So I just want to, you know, someone with their own small children. So I just want to encourage it's people of all ages. They need more mentors for the boys, as I understand it. Um, it's age five up through teenage. So it's, you know, they do every week, they have things, they do homework help. They're at the Y right now, um, you know, doing, you know, kind of a fun morning thing. They're constantly posting about activities. So it's just a really easy way to get involved and, and it's fun and fulfilling. Four yeah. hours a month. Four hours a month. Four hours a month. <laughs> okay. So uh, 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 thank you for coming, yeah. Stephanie. And anybody with any questions or can uh, Yes, yeah, so Stephanie, so Stephanie will be around after the service and she's actually coming to do um, a service for us on July 31st as well. So feel free to come and introduce yourself after service. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
And we uh, begin our service by lighting our chalice as we begin our time of reflection and meaning making. And Amel, would you like to help us light our chalice this morning? Or Lisa? You can all come up. The words for your chalice lighting are in your orders of service. We light this chalice in grateful, loving community. Even in the darkest of times, may it fly light paths to courage, justice, and hope. And I invite you, if you wish, to, to join with us in saying the unison affirmation. May we be reminded here of our highest aspirations and inspired to bring our gifts of love to all living beings. May we know once again that we are not isolated, but connected in wonder and joy to mystery and miracle in the universe, in this community, and each other. Rebecca Solnit writes, suddenly I came out of my thoughts to notice everything around me again. The catkins on the willows, the lapping of the water, the leafy patterns of the shadows across the path, and then myself walking with the alignment that comes only after miles, the loose diagonal rhythm of arms swinging in synchronization with legs in a body that felt long and stretched out, almost as sinuous as a snake. When you give yourself to places, they give you yourself back. The more one comes to know them, the more one seeds with them the invisible crop of memories and associations that will be waiting for when you get back, while new places offer up new thoughts and new possibilities. Exploring the world is one of the best ways of exploring the mind, and walking travels both terrains. This Sunday, we're exploring how places can give themselves back to us and how we can connect with nature in a variety of different ways. Um, we'll, be, we'll be talking not just about walking, but ways that we connect with our surroundings, with, with nature, and with this wonderful world around us. So with that in mind, let's sing our opening hymn. It's number 53, I Walk the Unfrequented Road, 53. So we have a story here today, and I mentioned we're talking about um, uh, talking about um, traveling and talking about walking. I was inspired because I know there this is a an area of uh, the country where there's a lot of people who like hiking. How many people like hiking here? Oh wow! So there's there's lots of um, lots of people who like hiking. Is there anybody who's looking to who doesn't have a hiking group who's looking to join a hiking group? There we go, we got a hiking group going. Those of you who have hiking groups, 
Talk to them later if, if, you have, if you have openings in your hiking group. How many, I mean, how can you not have an opening in a hiking group, right? Um, but there's lots of other ways to travel as, as well, right? I mean, walking is, is, is a wonderful way if, if we're able to, 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 to do so. But there are lots of other ways to travel. Does anyone know any other ways to travel? What's that? Bike? Yeah, biking's a good one. Reading. Imagination. Imagination is an excellent way to travel. We'll be traveling there in just a minute. Perfect. Any others? Reading. Skis, kayaks, so many different ways. Cars, although they use gas. Wheelchairs, which are much more environmentally friendly. Um, there are so many ways of traveling. Um, and, when, when, and, it, it's, it's, and we also travel uh, through time as well. Like we, we get older and we, we, we experience new things and it's kind of like a journey as well. So there's a little story about that and I wonder what our story is about. One of the things we do here is we have a wonder box because we are a people of wonder and uh, we wonder about the world. Would anyone like to open the wonder box this morning? Do we have any? Coco. Hi, that's awesome. If you would. Uh, so it is, it is Tupperware, but Tupperware isn't the item, though it could be. It could be. Does anyone know what's in there? Seeds is correct. Well, if you read the order of service, you've got a clue, don't you? But <laughs> excellent. Thank you. So this is a story about a seed. And it's a story um, that I kind of put together, though it's, it's a, it's, it features a, 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 a tune by a colleague of mine, Mary Gregolia, a wonderful little tune. How many of you know, I know this rose will open? Well, if you don't know it, you're going to know it in about two minutes. Um, so hand with this. Let's see if I can manage this. I should have gotten a guitar with a strap. Is anyone willing to be an assistant? Um, so, uh, if you just kind of hold it right. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of right. So the tune goes like this. It's quite, it's quite simple. It's in your hymnals, but I'm not going to tell you because then you'll be looking down the whole time. I know this rose will open. I know my fear will burn away. I know my soul will unfurl its wings. I know this rose will open. Great, you already know. Stick it one more time. I know this rose will open. I know my fear will burn away. I know my soul will unfurl its wings. I know this rose will open. So there was a little seed that was deep underneath the ground. And all the other little seeds said, well, you just need to wait. Because there wasn't much happening, and the seed was a bit bored. Have you ever been a bit bored and a bit restless? Hopefully you're not feeling that now. But this little seed, and it was cold, but then it was suddenly getting a little bit warmer. And the seed thought that she could hear things. Let's go with our imagination here. Uh, and, uh, and the seed said, I, I want to travel the world. And they said, no, just wait. You know, things are going to happen. But the seed wanted to travel. So the seed uh, started to shift and poked her head just above the ground. And she saw there rocks and grasses. It was the first time she'd seen that. And it was the most amazing thing. And the seed knew she was about to go on an adventure. And it was almost like the world was knocking. And she had to open that door. She wanted to know more about the world. And as she thought about the world, she heard a song within herself that went, I know this rose will open. I know my fear will burn away. I know my soul will unfurl its wings. I know my soul will open. And so the little seed was on the ground and was quite happy to be on the ground. But then something extraordinary happened. An eagle. Have any of you ever seen an eagle? Yeah. Got eagles around here, don't we? Because it, it was around here, actually, that this actually happened. So it was one of those eagles came and flew around and landed on the ground. And unbeknownst to the eagle entirely, the seed attached to the eagle. And all of a sudden, the seed was flying through the air. And it was quite terrifying. Can you imagine? It was quite a rush. 
And um, if you've ever had a moment like that, I haven't had anything exactly like that, but maybe something similar, you know it's quite scary. And the only thing that the seed could think to do was sing a song to give her, herself some encouragement. So she sang in her heart, I know this rose will open. I know my fear will burn away. I know my soul will unfurl its wings. I know this rose will open. Well, the eagle went to the top of a very high mountain. You may have been to this mountain, but I won't tell you which one. And the sea, and the seed was, um, the, the bird then ruffled its feathers. Can you do that? You know, birds sometimes do. Did a little ruffle. And the seed fell off and was on back on the ground again, which was felt very comforting for the seed. And the seed could see a vista, a view for miles around and saw the magnificent world, same world we're in actually, saw the valleys and the trees and the waters and uh, the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of the Catskills <laughs> and it was all beautiful. And, and the seed was very happy now and looked out of there because now it knew the world that it lived in. And funnily enough, it knew something else too. She knew a little bit about who she was. And she loved it up there, she loved the view, but she also felt a little bit lonely. And she was feeling much less afraid. So she leaned forward, and this time we might need, I don't know, we must have a couple of interpretive dancers in this, in this congregation. <laughs> we haven't lined anybody up. But if you can imagine a seed in the breeze, if anybody wants to dance that out, that would be wonderful. And while this seed, yeah, there we go. Uh, went in the breeze, this song flowed through, it, it flowed through the air. I know this rose will open. I know my fears will burn away. I know my soul will unfurl its wings. I know this rose will open seed went this way and that way until it landed on the ground not very far from where it had started. But oh, what a difference it makes. And it was in the same place it burrowed a little bit into the earth and then it felt quite comfy and at home. And you know, something was beginning to happen and it was, uh, something was happening. Do you know what might have been happening? Yeah, spring was happening and and the, the, and the seed, or the rose seed, was going up into the world and, and coming up in, into that world and feeling herself uh, grow and change, and it was all wonderful. So while she changed, and feel free to dance this one too, as she grew, she sang, I know this rose will open. I know my fears will burn away. I know my soul will unfurl its wings. I know this rose will open. And she did. So every time you see a, a rose or a flower, know that each one of them has an amazing story, just like each of you have. No, even if you don't move a muscle, you've been on an incredible journey this, this far. And we all have an amazing story. And we all are beautiful, just as we are, and just as we want to be. We are beautiful. So thank you for being a part of this wonder story. Thank you to all my dancers and my musicians. I'm, I have to say, I'm probably one of the top 100 guitarists in this congregation. But I hope you get a chance to hear the other 99. Um, we are, and we're really delighted that the children can join us here today. Uh, so great to be together. We're going to sing, sing the children off to their classroom as they in, enjoy their, their time and we enjoy ours. Um, and so we'll sing them off to our classroom. Where you So we now have uh, a, a, a time of joys and sorrows, which is an opportunity to share a uh, major moment. Oh, yes, thank you. Oh, I, 
I went ahead. So we'll have the reading uh, uh, now, which uh, Vicky O'Darty at the last minute, thank you, Vicky, for stepping up, will be uh, reading. Uh, again, there are many ways. We have, we're not all hikers or walkers, but this, I think, speaks about the connection to nature in such a lovely way. So this is uh, Thomas Clark in Praise of Walking. Early one morning, any morning, we can set out with the least possible baggage and discover the world. It is quite possible to refuse all the coercion, violence, property, triviality, to simply walk away. That something exists outside ourselves and our preoccupations. So near, so readily available, is our greatest blessing. Walking is the human way of getting about. Always, everywhere, people have walked, veining the earth with paths, visible and invisible, symmetrical and meandering. Walking is a noble, a mobile form of waiting. What I take with me, what I leave behind, are of less importance than what I discover along the way. To be completely lost is a good thing on a walk. The most distant places seem most accessible once one is on the road. Convictions, directions, opinions are of less importance than sensible shoes. Mm -hmm. In the course of a walk, we usually find out something about our companion, and this is true even when we walk along. When I spend a day talking, I, I feel exhausted. When I spend it walking, I am pleasantly tired. Wrong turnings, doubling back, Causes and digressions all contribute to the dislocation of a persistent self-interest. Everything we meet is equally important or unimportant. The lonely places are the most lovely. Walking is egalitarian and democratic. We do not become experts at walking, and one side of the road is as good as another. One continues on a long walk, not through effort of will, but through fidelity. Storm clouds, rain, hail. When we have survived these, we seem to have taken on some of the solidarity, solidity of, of trees and rocks. A day from dawn to dusk is the natural span of a walk. A dull walk is not without value. To walk for hours on a clear night is the largest experience we can have. For the right understanding of a landscape, information must come to the intelligence from the senses. Looking, singing, resting, breathing are all complementary to walking. Climbing uphill, the horizon grows wider. Descending, the hills gather round. We can take a walk which is a sampling of different airs. The invigorating air of the heights, the filtered air of a pine forest, the rich air ever over plowed earth. We can walk between two places and in so doing, establish a link between them, bring them into a warmth of contact, like introducing two friends. There are walks on which I lose myself, walks which return me to myself again. Is there anything better than to be out walking in the clear air? We'll now enter into a time of reflection, personal reflection, meditation, and prayer. Um, what we'll do is I'll say a, a brief uh, spoken prayer um, on behalf of us all, and uh, then we'll, we'll uh, play a, a meditative hymn, Spirit of Life, which we'll sing through once. Um, you can remain seated for that, and then we'll have a time of silence. Um, and silence is another way to travel the world, I find, and connect with the world. So we'll have a time of silent reflection. Um, to close out this time of, of, of meditation. So I invite us all into the spirit of reflection, meditation, prayer. Mother Nature, Mother God, spirit of all life, when our lives are changing and when our lives are not changing as fast as they might, help us to appreciate the journey and hold on to the good. When our lives are full, maybe too full, 
and when our lives feel empty. Help us to hear the trickle of that stream in our lives that takes us inexorably from one moment to the next. And let us relax into that stream of life until we are in a new place in our own reckoning. I know this rose will open. I know my fear will burn away. I know my soul will unfurl its wings. We return to nature again and again and again. We find solace in the elm trees, strength in the mountains, Hope whistles to us on the breeze. We return to nature again and again. To dust we are, and to dust we shall return. But it's all glory. So glorious to see the flowers in blossom in spring, to feel the air on our faces, to walk the unfrequented road, to experience the vast silence of nature, deep and wide, a silence bubbling at times with birdsong and brook. A vast and deep silence that consoles us and lifts us up. It's all glory. I know this rose will open. Mother Nature, Mother God, Spirit of all life, when our lives are changing and when our lives are not changing as fast as they might, help us to appreciate the journey and hold on to the good. I invite us to sing together uh, Spirit of Life. It's number 123. May the spirit of life find us exactly where we are and bring us a vitality that, uh, that 
uh, enlists us and those around us. Amen. Uh, before we have the offering this morning, an update on the pledge uh, campaign. Uh, we are at 89,000, give or take. Uh, the uh, the, the budget, the proposed budget for next year is 137,000. So if anybody has $48,000, we could sort it out <laughs> right today. No, that, that is a big gap. Uh, perhaps it's not unexpected. It's been a really hard year. But um, if, if you haven't uh, made a pledge yet and you're, uh, you'd like to, um, we, we, we're, we're hoping to wrap up on Tuesday. So if you could, um, uh, Karma and Lois could help you make a, a pledge here after the service. So if you approach them or ask them any questions, they'd be happy, happy to help with that. Thank you to all those who have pledged. Thank you who, who give um, so uh, generously. Um, our offering uh, today is shared with, um, somebody help me out here. Thank you. Yeah. You look for a sign and you find one. Uh, it's shared with Hudson River Sloop Clearwater. Um, a really remarkable uh, or, uh, uh, organization founded by Pete Seeger and known for its sailing vessel, the Clear, Clearwater, and for its annual music and environmental festival. So we're really uh, delighted to share uh, uh, the, 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 our, the offering with, uh, this, this Sunday. Um, so you can give in all the ways listed over there online or by check. There's also now, we're trying something new, a QR code. We're getting very advanced here on your order of service. So um, I, we've checked it out and it works. Hopefully it'll work for you. Like So um, all, all donations are gratefully accepted as well as uh, simply being here is, is, is very, we're very grateful for that. Um, our, our offering uh, this uh, morning will uh, is... Um, on the Meadow by uh, H. Lichtner, and we thank Bill Tool, our pianist. <laughs> When I was about 18 years old, I was 18 years old actually, thank you for all that you, you uh, bring to this congregation by the way, all the offerings of, of financial support, of, of volunteer effort and, and the spirit and your presence, it's much appreciated. So I don't think I've told you about when I was 18 years old and I went on a walk and I didn't stop walking until I discovered the meaning of life. So that's what I want to tell you about today. It was a bit of a weird time for me. I found 18 years old, being 18 years old, difficult. I don't know if those of you who are above 18 did as well. I was going to university in England. It was another of my sojourns in England. And um, things were going OK, but I, I wasn't quite sure what I was doing with my life. I was in a bit of a slump. Um, this was pre-COVID days, so slumps were so much milder than they seem now. But it was a hard time. And to top it all off, there was someone I was 
interested in, in a sort of romantic way, and she hadn't returned my calls. I know that seems impossible to believe, but it's, <laughs> it's true. So I decided, and it wasn't really a decision, I just woke up one morning and I said, I'm going to go on a walk until I discover the meaning of life. And I got out of my door, it was first thing in the morning, 10.30 a.m., we were college students. <laughs> and I headed, my roommates weren't even up yet, I headed out the door and I headed west. And I had this little idea in my mind that I would head west until I had figured it all out. And it might take me a while, so I was in Birmingham which is in the Midlands, but it's kind of close to Wales, so I said, maybe I'll hit Wales and learn Welsh on the way, and if, if I don't find it by then, I'll, I'll hop on a container ship and head back to America. That was the plan. But really, I was just walking, and I was just walking and trying, trying to think of it all. And by the time I had gone 20 minutes, I uh, was in the suburbs of the little kind of town, uh, suburb of Bur Birmingham, where, I, where we the student residences were, and um, I could hear the birds and see the trees, and I already felt a kind of, you know, it wasn't an answer to the meaning of life. I had been studying philosophy, so I was used to answers being up here, or at least trying for answers and not, not arriving them. But I felt a kind of a vitality. You know, when sometimes when you're out walking if, and you're or just outside, and I felt uh, the connection with the, the, the air, and I felt um, um, the kind of uh, s spring in my step and an ache in my step as well, because I wasn't used to walking. And everything felt kind of alive. And though it didn't immediately answer the questions, everything was immediately sort of transformed in a, in a subtle but kind of profound way. And I was already starting to feel a bit better. I didn't turn around. This would be a very short sermon. I kept going because there were more answers. It couldn't be the only answer, right? I had to, I had to f find out what was going. So I went for a ways, and I, was, I, was, I went on a, on for another hour or so. When I came across a shop, um, any of you been a shop before? Yes, well, I'm asking silly questions. Um, but you know, after having been walking and being, being a little bit, bit tired, I walked into the sh shop, and not for the first time or the last time, I was just amazed by there being so much in this one place. Uh, pretty much anything I could imagine, sausage rolls or sodas or chocolate bars, and all of it, um, something that could be a part of my day. It just felt like such an incredible luxury after the abundance of nature to feel the abundance of human society in this little mini-mart. And I settled on a cheese and onion quiche and a chocolate flapjack. If you've never had a flapjack, it's kind of, a, um, kind of like an oatmeal bar in England. I know there are pancakes here. But delicious, anyway. I decided to, to travel a while before, until I got hungry, until I partake of the cheese and onion quiche. And I made it about to the end of the car park. Um, <laughs> and it tasted fantastic. And I thought to myself, maybe this is the meaning of life, right? Enjoy what you have, even if it's just a cheese and onion quiche. It's a pretty good meaning of life. Well, I may have liked it, but I was soon done with it. I'm, I've never been good at mindful eating. I, I can eat mindfully, but very quickly. It takes me about two seconds. And I kept walking, and I was well out of the city now, trying to head west, but it was a little difficult because of all these little meandering paths in England, and it was beautiful, you know? Uh, large stretches of nothing, of grass and, and fields, and going over stiles and falling over the mud and picking myself up and falling over the mud again. And, um, you know, one of my favorite stories is, is the Odyssey, um, and all these things happened to Odysseus, and here I was on a journey, and it didn't feel like much happening. It happens in a different time frame. But then again, it didn't take me 10 years. Um, so I went a bit further, and what I saw next was a field of uh, sheep, beautiful creatures, sheep, right? And all the sheep, I, could, I had the feeling that I was the most interesting thing that was happening to them in that moment, <laughs> which was quite humbling and awesome. I felt quite, you know, and I greeted them, said, hello, sheep, and, and not only did they all turn to look at me and gather up to, 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 to look at me, little me just walking along the way. As I walked by, I was kind of in an alley by with the sheep in their field over there. The sheep followed me all the way and were, were watching me, and they watched me until there, there was a fence and they couldn't go any further. And I just uh, felt like such a celebrity. I felt amazing. <laughs> and I thought maybe this is the meaning of life, that wherever you are, you are important to somebody. And I know it wasn't for any, any magnificent quality that I was important to the sheep. I was, I was something to, to, to take their attention. But even so, I knew I, I mattered to them. And it, me, it mattered to me that I mattered to them. And so I thought, maybe this is what it's all about, mattering to someone. Well, I was grateful for those sheep, but I had more, more uh, 
uh, ground to cover, um, sometimes literally as I kept falling over in the mud and my, my <laughs> jacket, I got a nice warm jacket, that's another meaning of life, bring a warm jacket. Um, and uh, lots of nothing happened and then I saw uh, an event in the distance and I, there were horses, it was some kind of equestrian event. Now I'm no equestrian so I didn't know what they were doing but they were kind of, uh, it seemed like teenagers and parents and they were all driving up in their cars and going, coming to some event and I was all excited. I thought here's something that's happening. And because I was walking, I saw it from a distance and then nearer and nearer, and I was starting to get excited and excited. And then uh, uh, I was about a half mile away when a, a couple that seemed to be connected, I think it was a mother and a daughter probably, were there, their daughter in riding gear. And I was, hadn't had any human society for the whole day other than the, the, the clerk at the Minimark. So I said, hello, hello, good to see you. And I got blanked. They walked right by me, just looked at me with this look of, I can't even tell you what it was, but it wasn't good, and then just kept walking. And I thought, all right, you know, some people, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, but I was a little hurt, and I was a little, you know, felt a little, yeah, I'd been waiting for this and a little disappointed. All I wanted was the, a little hello. But then as I walked a little further, I did think about it a little more. And uh, as I said, I was wearing a jacket covered in, covered in mud by this stage. And if you think my beard is bad now, in college, I really rocked the pr prophetic look. And I had the hair was long. And, uh, and I had an American accent, which you're not expecting in the suburbs of, of, of Birmingham. Um, and here I am, uh, out of nowhere. And I was in the middle of nowhere. Um, um, uh, and it seemed to walk out of the fields and greet them. So as I was walking, and with the, one of the great things about walking is you have lots of time to think about things, I thought, well, I could see how I might shock them a little <laughs> from my perspective. And I thought, maybe this is the meaning of life, that in time we can understand one another. We, it is so easy to g g run afoul of each other, to hurt one another. Um, and maybe with time we can understand a little bit of what it is to walk a mile in somebody else's shoes. Or maybe we can't understand, but we can understand how different we are. And so came and I understood a little bit more. And I walked on some more, and then something quite exciting happened. Um, you're out in the country now here in Los Angeles. How, how many of you have, have ever bumped into an electric fence? Um, yeah, a couple of hands. You all are much more responsible than me, I'll tell you. Well, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, I, I, so I know children sometimes do it on a dare, and if it's low voltage, don't ever do it. But, um, you know, it, it, it's okay. But when it's a surprise and it happens, um, and I was going, trying to get through, the light was getting darker. It was a late afternoon now. And I, I, was, I just bumped into this fence. I, was, I didn't know it was there. It was, it was uh, kind of between these hedges. And um, I was okay. But it was kind of a, um, how do you describe it, um, a shock, <laughs> right? And you have this terrible moment. I mean, it, life's a lot like that, right? You're just walking along and everything's fine and then something changes all of a sudden. Well, this was a literal shock in my life. And the worst thing was I had to keep going and it was getting dark and I kind of, I, I could go back, but I had to go like two miles to go back the same. So I thought there was a little way path out this way and then there was, kind of two hedges, there's lots of hedges in England, and a path in between. And I kind of peered forward to try to see if there was an electric fence, but then I thought, this is really daft, I'm gonna electrocute my own nose, which is a bad place. To... <laughs> so I, I couldn't see, I didn't think there was anything there, but you know, it's really hard when life has already brought you a trauma to believe. So I took a few steps back, and I thought, you know what, I don't, I'm just gonna have to, um, and I just sprinted through. And let me tell you, there are many joys in life, but the joy of not being electrocuted <laughs> is just a magnificent one. I mean, it happens to us all the time, but we, we, of, we often take it for granted. And in that moment, I was, I was, uh, I was very happy. Um, and I, I, I'm glad to say I wasn't electrocuted for the rest of the, um, the, 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 encamp the walk. Um, I was a little worried when I, um, have to attend to the call of nature when you've already worried about. But anyway, there were lots of other wonders on that walk. My little tiny wonders, a manor that I didn't know who it was and looked like something out of Clue or a strawberry patch and all that kind of stuff. But really there was the walking. I don't want to get too into what I saw. You can go on a walk and talk about what you saw and that's great. But there's something about just the journey itself, whether you're walking or whether it's the journey of life. 
and the being out there that just feels really embodied. And I think that has stuck with me through my life. I've always loved walking and, and hiking. And I, I've mentioned to some of you after my uh, separation a couple years ago, I did a lot of walking. I walked, tried to walk from west to east across England. Um, and I got about halfway in little segments, a little bit at a time. And a lot of the walks had nothing, to, nothing much happened. Um, but it was great. It was just something about being out in the midst of nature. And I know I talked about a silence. And I know nature isn't silent. But it was like I wasn't really looking for answers. But I was looking for to, to know that the world was a place I could live in. And sometimes when you hear that silence from, from the world and you're out in nature, and maybe some of you will identify with this, you just know you have a place in the world. And you know that the world is a marvelous place and you're reminded of that. And so I'm always grateful to this vast silence of nature that answers us back in our worries and kind of has a way in the silence of saying, you know, it's okay. It's all right. It will be all right. But I have to tell you how I get home, right? That's kind of, kind of Im important. Or whether I went to Wales or, or America. I did not. I was looking. I was, I was ready to go home, and I was feeling tired, and it had been a long day, and it was, it was nighttime now. And I was looking for a sign. Oh, the sign's gone. But anyway, and I got a sign. It was about 30 feet by 50 feet, and it was up. I was down, and I could see up on the hill, and it was a sign, and it said, Birmingham, 35 miles. <laughs> Which seemed like a long way, but I, I don't know. I mean, I had seen a, you'd seen a sign. You got it. So I walked up here. And I was walking along on the side of the road. It was the M42, which is a highway. Now, I know I said don't get electrocuted by electric fence. Don't walk on the highway. It's a really, really bad idea. Very, very unsafe. Um, but I did. Um, and I walked, and I thought, well, it's 35 miles. You know, not, what else to do? I wouldn't know the way home. right? I didn't have a, this was before cell phones became a thing. And uh, I, I wandered on the way. And I made it about half a mile before someone came to pick me up. And the lights turned on on the top of the police cruiser, and he pulled over. And he let me in, and as I came in there, he said, thousand pound fine for walking on the side of the road, which is about $1,500, $1,600. Something in the way that the police officer said it made me think that maybe I wouldn't be paying a thousand pounds, but this was a lot more money than I had in my bank account. As a matter of fact, my bank account was negative. <laughs> so I knew I couldn't pay it. So it was a pretty uh, nervous ride home. And um, one of the things it kind of taught me about the meaning of life is sometimes there can be signs and you don't need to follow them. You know, sometimes you just know that you don't actually need to follow that sign. But there was another thing as well, because uh, the police officer, who I, I really didn't want to encounter in the moment of him threatening me with a thousand pound fine, did actually drive me all the west of the way home. And he dropped me off, uh, well, he dropped me about a mile from where I lived and said, do you have money for the bus? And I did, and I hopped on the bus. Um, and so sometimes it's the people you least expect who help you out, the people who you might have, have trouble with who um, are there to kind of save the day. And I don't know what would have happened <laughs> if I was walking back. So I got home, and I got back into my student flat, and everything was pretty much the way I left it, except Mark was awake now. It was 7 p.m., and he, he greeted me. He was one of my roommates, and he said, uh, do you want to go to the pub? And you know what? I did want to go to the pub. And so then I ended with a quiet drink with my roommates and talking about my adventures uh, with uh, my flatmate, who was a kind and understanding soul and remains so. He lives in Brighton, and I saw him last summer. But did I find the meaning of life, right? I had all these adventures. I had found many, several meanings of life, I suppose, and discovered what I already knew, which is life is what you make it. As John Lennon said, life is what happens when you are making other plans, but also life is in the way that we deal with what happens. I hadn't had a bad day of it, all things considered. You know, day that nothing really happened, I went for a walk, that's all. But I had a friend waiting at the end of it in a quiet night beyond all the adventures. And so because, as Homer said, there is a time for many words and there is also a time for sleep. I went off to bed dreaming of that vast silence of nature that accompanies us wherever we go, that is always waiting for us to simply be a part of it. And we are every moment of our lives uh, sharing with the trees as we breathe, sharing with the, the fishes and the birds and all the different creatures this life that we could not do alone. 
I went dreaming that dream of connection to all nature and ready to discover the meaning of life anew in the morning. So may we all discover the meaning of life each day as we travel the paths and as the paths travel us. Amen. So let us sing the closing hymn. Again, uh, one more step uh, uh, is, is one way. We, we're not all, we, we all travel in different ways. So I hope we can take this uh, metaphorically and symbolically about traveling on this journey. So we will sing our uh, closing hymn. It is one more step, right? Or do I have to? 168, thank you. One, one more step. My friends, it is good to get where we're going. It is even better, perhaps, to be on the way. So wherever you are this morning, wherever you're traveling to, let us enjoy the journey together. Be kind to our traveling companions, because we're all carrying difficult burdens. Love one another and enjoy this journey, because what an amazing world we get to live in. And we are part of the story with every step, with every word, with every prayer. So let's give it our all. Amen. We uh, uh, extinguish the flame with uh, these words from our uh, order of prayer. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, 